Yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to the People's Memorial Lecture Series Talk, part of Research Cyber Infrastructure Day. I invite you to come back out and visit tables and talk to our students who are presenting some of their work uh, where they have been using advanced cyber infrastructure at IU to get their work done. So we're so glad to have four students with us uh, who are talking. It's a great opportunity for them to get some experience um, as if they're going to a professional conference and talking to people about the work they've done. Um, and, and so it's really good. So please take the opportunity to do that. Visit the tables so you can learn more about the services offered by all kinds of different areas of IU for research. And I'm going to let the People's Memorial Lecture Series kick off. Uh, thank you, AVP Matt Link, for being here. Go, man, go. Matt and Matt's just fine. Uh, <laughs> thank you uh, for everybody coming. Appreciate it. This is an important uh, series. Um, you'll find these people's cards scattered about. We continue this series through uh, donations of any sort, uh, even including time. Uh, so this is important. Uh, I also want to thank AWS for being here uh, and sponsoring our events in the past and the future. Future, uh, you know, and and I think that uh, visiting the tables and the poster sessions are great. So Dr. David Crandall is going to kick off the series today and. David's been at IU for 12 years, uh, came from Cornell, which we will not hold against him, uh, and he's a professor in, in computer science, and machine learning, imaging, um, object rec recognition, uh, and not justice because there's so much more there, but you were going to talk about it today, right, and uh, you know, I think the thing that is that is that sits with me with uh, with David is it's been a long time collaborator, and we can't thank him enough for doing that and being so. Uh, as I stumble around, I'm going to exit. And sure. thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. So Matt said I've been here 12 years, and one of the reasons that I've been so successful here and my you know, I've stayed here is because of the help I've gotten from all you folks, because we've used extensive, extensively used resources that you folks um, create and have made available to you and to us. And uh, I know I've interacted with many of you in the, in the, in the, in the, the uh, context of doing that. And so I really appreciate all the effort you've made put into this. And um, I was actually thinking last night, your influence, the US influence on me actually goes way back before 12 years ago, because I was remembering that about 30 years ago, when I was a 12-year-old in State College, Pennsylvania, I was very nerdy. I was um, learning how to write Windows 3.1 programs with Borland C++, and uh, I wrote this little screensaver program one day on a snow day. Um, I was inspired by the snow, and so it was a little screensaver where like snow would fall from the ground, from the sky, and then it would accumulate on the ground, and the little snow pile would come and uh and sort of wipe it away and uh it would play like holiday music at the same time and so i i uploaded it to an ftp site it's called uh sika sika.indiana.edu um the center for innovative computing applications and they sent me in november 1992 this uh cd-rom that has the whole sika archive including my program and uh, so then my program was downloaded by people. I, I got, I didn't have emails, I didn't get emails, but I got a couple of handwritten letters uh, saying how cool my screensaver was. And, you know, this was like extraordinarily impactful for a 12 year old. So I just really appreciate that sort of your vision and the investments that you make in cyber infrastructure here that are so impactful, not only for faculty and staff, but also for those pre-teens in Central Pennsylvania. Um, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is computer vision, which is my main research area. I'm not going to talk sort of specifically about my work, although that will obviously come up and be biases towards that. I wanted to instead sort of paint a picture of where computer vision has been, where it is right now, and where it's going. It's a super hot field. There's a lot of excitement, a lot of confusion. So I want to sort of take stock of where we are. So I'll start by saying that, of course, we recently um, some, 
Um, 200 years ago, sorry, uh, two years ago, we celebrated the 200th anniversary <laughs> of IU's founding. And it briefly crossed my mind at the time, why are there no pictures of IU's founding? And the reason is because the first photo ever taken wasn't taken until IU's sixth birthday in 1826. So imaging has been around for about 100, uh, 200 years. These days, of course, we think nothing of taking these big, beautiful photos like this one. There's probably, oh, 200 cameras in this room right now, I would guess, among all of our devices. And there's an enormous amount of visual information that's being created. Three trillion photos taken just on iPhones last year. In addition to all of the visual data from scientific experiments, astronomy, biology, all these sources of data all around the world, and um, of visual data. And so we've gotten very good at taking all of this imagery. Um, until recently, though, we haven't been very good at computers that can actually understand what's in these images. And of course, that is key to helping us organize all of this imagery that's being collected. And so I, I thought maybe I'd go down a little bit of memory lane to talk a little bit about how we got to the point where we are right now in vision, sort of where we are, and then maybe chart some directions. For the future. So I think as far as I could tell, IE was about 100 years old back in around 1920s when people started thinking about machines they could see. This is an article from Popular Science, strange eyes that never sleep, and they they foretell like these machines that will be able to do fairly simple things like count how many cars are going by a roadway. Um, sometimes we got a bit, of that, uh, a bit ahead of ourselves. So in 1958, the Navy had a sort of notorious press conference where they unveiled their computer that will be able to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce itself, and be conscious of its existence. <laughs> it turned out to be a little bit premature. <laughs> You know, that's because a lot of the problems in AI and computer vision specifically are just so hard. And they don't seem hard because seeing is something that most of us do without really thinking. Um, you know, this has tripped up the, the greatest minds in the field. So back in 1966, again, kind of notoriously, uh, MIT professor Marvin Minsky, who's considered one of the uh, leaders of AI, asked an undergraduate student to spend the summer linking the camera to a computer and getting the computer to describe what it saw. And it was like, apparently, this wasn't a joke. Both the undergraduate student and Minsky thought that this was a good, like, fairly well-focused, well-scoped summer project. <laughs> <laughs> like, 60 years later, we're still working on this. Um, so it's clearly a very, very good thing. Now, in sort of the early days, which I'd say is sort of the 70s and 80s of vision into the 90s, um, people took a very kind of geometric approach to computers. The idea was to understand like how rays of light bounce off scenes, 3D scenes, create an image on an imaging plane, and then thinking about how to recognize properties of those images that are created. And so for example, when I was first getting into vision, um, as an undergraduate student, we were working on things like identifying that where in this image with a bunch of clutter, this little uh, toy rabbit is. Of course, it's like right in the center, but it's still at the time, pretty difficult problem. And uh, the approaches were based on like geometry, looking for primitives of shapes here, trying to stitch those shape primitives together in order to identify a, um, this particular uh, object. And this involved like a lot of hand coding of things. You had to define what the object looks like, what curves you're looking for, and so on. Um, a bit later, right around the turn of the century, uh, people in vision started using machine learning. And uh, probably the first, the first widespread successful example of that, maybe in the mainstream computer, uh, computer vision uh, community, was this paper by Viola and Jones in 2001. So they collected an, a massive data set of, well, massive at the time, of like 10,000 images of faces and non-faces uh, using this machine learning technique recently developed called AdaBoost. And AdaBoost like found these primitives of image features automatically. They're basically like these little rectangles that are sort of predictive of faces. And then they're able to scan around an image and find, and find the faces. And this was a big development in the field of face recognition, but also sort of injected this idea of machine learning into the vision community. Um, a few years later, 
we were sort of doing machine learning combined with some of this geometric reasoning. So this I'll pick on my PhD thesis for a moment. This was about 15 years ago. I'm not gonna talk about the details, but the idea is there was sort of this hybrid approach where uh, a person kind of defined things about an object, but then parts of it were learned automatically. Um, so for example, we have this kind of creepy figure that shows uh, what a face looks like. And the face consists of this discrete set of parts, and then we could use machine learning to learn models for each of those individual parts, what each individual part looks like. And then we use statistics and machine learning and uh, probability in order to describe how those parts can move relative to one another, either in a video or across different images of different people. And uh, so this is sort of this hybrid approach, injecting both mach uh, machine learning and uh, expert knowledge into this problem. And on one hand, the techniques, again, this is in my thesis, so I can make fun of this, um, the, the techniques worked really well in that we could download like real images that people actually took uh, and uploaded to the internet as opposed to those carefully controlled lab images from before. And look, we can detect all the bicycles. This is a bicycle detector. Detect all the bicycles in these images. If you're at all suspicious that those look easy, you would write because if like in cases like this where the bike is clearly there, we would just totally miss it. And we would also find bicycles all over the place. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, what happened about 10 years ago was this real revolution in AI machine learning and computer vision, which you all know about, you've all heard about, um, if you haven't participated actively. So this is the deep learning revolution. This is the resurgence of neural networks in artificial intelligence and in computer vision specifically. Um, most of the technology underlying the neural networks are the same that were developed sort of in the 60s, but there's now massive amounts of data, very fast computers, uh, some a substantial number of engineering and science breakthroughs as well. I don't want to don't want to diminish that, but a lot of it is just that it is it's way more processing power and way more data. And you know, I think early on, especially in computer vision, people were really skeptical of these results that were being published because. We have tried neural networks for decades and they never seemed to work. In fact, if you had submitted, I think in 2012, a paper to a computer vision conference that used a neural network, reviewers' eyes would basically glaze over and they'd be like, what are you doing? These don't work, you know, reject. And that's it. Um, like many big events in life, I think everybody has their story about how they realize that learning really was the thing that you need to pay attention to. Um, I'll tell you my story. So my story is that for many years, I was interested in, I have been interested in the problem of geo, visual geolocation. So this is like given a photo that was taken somewhere on earth, but it doesn't have GPS tags. All you have is the image itself. Can the computer identify where it was taken? Sometimes quite easy, like this is probably Paris, although it could be Las Vegas or Epcot Center, a couple other places. Um, sometimes it's quite difficult, like this image. And so during my postdoc in uh, around 2009, I studied this problem really ex extensively. I spent like a year on it. Um, we developed a technique that we were very proud of for this visual geolocation problem. I'll just sort of give you the minimum amount of information you need to know to understand this table. Um, basically, you, one way to pose the image geolocation problem is as a multiple choice problem. So you can give the computer an image and then give 10 possible places where it was taken and measure what percentage of the time it correctly chooses among those 10. So the random baseline, if you're randomly guessing, was 10%. Um, our system got about 58% accuracy, which while being far away from 100%, we felt better about the fact that it was far away from 10% also. Um, and then we did some human studies where we had like basically grad students at Cornell also do this task, and they got about 68% performance. So we weren't that far off what like humans were able to do. Um, so one day in like 2013, one of my brilliant grad students, Stephen Lee, who is now assistant professor at uh, Oregon State University, came into my office and was like, there's this really deep learning thing. Remember that visual location problem that you were working on in your postdoc? And I was like, yes, that problem I kind of quickly solved, you know, during my postdoc after spending a year of effort, he's like, yeah, that one. He's like, I wanna try deep learning on this. And I was like, okay, fine, you know, waste your time. 
solving a problem I already solved and fine. Uh, and uh, so he spent a week. He used deep red two, uh, big red two, sorry, big red two, which had GPUs ready to go, so you could just log in and start using them. And foresight of the US. Um, and uh, he spent a week, and here are the results in there. So his results were eighty-one percent compared to our fifty-eight percent that I spent a year getting. Compared to the 68% human baseline, which I uh, very foolishly described in various talks as an upper bound on how well you can do it. <laughs> so this made us realize, at least locally, that this idea of deep learning was, was really something we needed to pay attention to. And um, instead of like kind of this combination of human created features and uh, machine learning, the idea behind deep learning is it just learns from data to the labels directly. So you don't have to, you don't have to do as much effort in, in creating a new model, creating a new model. And of course, because of this, it has uh, revolutionized a wide range of um, problems in AI and in computer vision specifically. And these sort of fill the headlines, things with like Facebook's face recognition approaching human level performance. Uh, computer can recognize emotions better than most people. I don't know what it means, but. Sounds impressive. AI that's better at humans is fine with lung cancer with a lot of fine print caveats, but nonetheless, very, very exciting um, results going on. Because of this excitement, the computer vision community has also grown in size and in prominence. So this is a graph showing the attendance at the main computer vision conference. I chopped off the pandemic because it's complicated everything, but in 2019 anyway, you can see there was basically exponential growth. Almost 10 times as many people come to this computer than before. Huge amounts of investment in computer vision. And in fact, in the scientific community, computer vision has also reached actually astounding problems. So, this is according to Google Scholar, the top publications, not in computer science, but in science. And number five on there is the conference on computer vision and pattern recognition, right below science. So computer vision is seems to be like on top of the world, so much hype. So I, I thought I would maybe, uh, we still haven't like achieved this goal of computers that can be able to see. And so instead, what we've been able to do is make contributions on, and make really substantial contributions on very focused areas. And so what I wanted to do maybe is talk about like, what are those focused areas? and sort of what are the limitations that we're finding right now and what sort of prevents us from moving from there to this grand vision that we've been working on for 60 years of vision and machines. So let me give you some, some, some uh, sort of a selection of some of the problems and results that people have gotten. What are people studying? And uh, so, so for, to sort of make this even more concrete, up in the upper right, I have put like a mathematical notation for what the problem we're trying to solve in this problem is. Because of course, it's all about like finding functions and things, nothing more exotic than that. So for example, image classification. This is a very, very popular problem. Given an image, we want to produce a label that describes that image. In this case, it's whether or not a, uh, something on the skin is cancerous or not. And in this particular paper, they found that the AI system, the computer vision system outperformed the human experts, again, with a bunch of caveats. So this says from a like, if you take out sort of the exoticness of it, cut it down to what it really is, we're trying to find a function f that maps an image to a label. That's what we're trying to do. And then you can sort of make this problem more complicated. So instead of saying what is in the image at the image level, let's try to find all the objects in the image, find all the faces in the image, put bounding boxes around all of them. Or not only find all of the bounding boxes around faces, but identify all the different objects in these images and put bounding boxes around object detection. This is a result from a few years ago now, but I find it really amazing. Um, it's from something called the iNaturalist Challenge. And basically, uh, folks have trained neural networks, neural network models that can identify among 2,000 different species of animals. I think this is really cool because I know like the scientific name of exactly zero animals. And so the, <laughs> this is an example of something that does way better than me. 
It's not 100% accurate. It's like 60, 70% accurate, but still, that's pretty good on a 2000 class problem. Let's see, object tracking. So trying, we're sort of making the problems uh, more complicated in an incremental way. So now we don't have a single image frame, but we have a series of frames. We're trying to find all the objects and all those frames across time. Uh, semantic segmentation makes the problem even slightly more complicated. So now instead of putting bounding boxes around objects, we're trying to basically mark every pixel in the image according to what kind of object. So it's like next level of granularity. And then there's a lot of work that's looking at the connection between images and language. Um, so for example, in this problem, given an image, we want to create a caption, automatically create a caption that describes that image. This also is viewed and like a, posed as like an end-to-end -end machine learning problem. So you give the system a bunch of images, you give it a bunch of captions for those images, and it's supposed to learn the correspondence between images and captions. It doesn't know anything about the English language. It just learns that implicitly. And then you can apply it on new images and see what it does. I'm typing on my laptop computer. Pretty good. I'm shopping at a store. I'm eating a plate of food with salad and sandwich. Okay, that's chicken teriyaki, but still, that's pretty good considering how, you know, 10 years ago we were finding bicycles on beds. Um, okay, then this language and imagery connection can get sort of more complicated, however more complicated you want it to get. So for example, question answering, visual question answering is a hot topic in computer vision. The idea is that you give an image and you give the system a question, and then the system has to figure out the answer to that question according to the image. What color is illuminated on the traffic light? Red. What is the man holding a phone? What board is shown? Crazy. And so on. And then there's work on image generation, image transformation. This is the deep fakes that everyone talks a lot about. Um, and so, like, there's various variants of this. One is to learn correspondences between images. So, like, learn in models that can automatically translate between a Monet painting, and then can hallucinate what the real world version of that painting was, or vice versa, or whatever, convert zebras to horses, whatever you want to do, right? Uh, seasons, so on. All learned using deep machine learning. Or image generation. So in, in this uh, problem, you're given some kind of label or description, and you're supposed to, the system is supposed to automatically produce an image. And uh, you know, none of these people actually exist. They were people that were facial images that were created by a system that had learned what a face image is based on looking at many millions of images. Most recently, um, you've probably heard of DALI, which is sort of the, uh, what's in, entered the popular consciousness in this, in this domain. This is a system that's created by OpenAI. Um, there's various ways of using it. I'll show you some examples here that are, uh, created by a colleague, Aliyushua Efros. So in this variant, he loaded in his image, that's him, Aliyushua, and then he added a sentence and the system was then supposed to make a modification to the image according to the sentence. So the input image and he puts in person holding a laptop, there it is. Learn how to do that totally automatically. The face is blurred for privacy reasons, but if you look at it, like the quality is really quite astounding. Like think about all the reasoning that had to happen here. Like the system had to put like the laptop on top of this scarf, but notice how it knew to put the laptop below this scarf. That's crazy. I mean, and like the scarf is a little bit weird. It gets like bigger down here in a way that's not really explained. But there's like shadows here that make sense. The hands are a little bit weird. Still, this is really quite impressive. Uh, he did some other examples. A person holding a birthday cake. Look, we did it. Knows what a birthday cake is, no problem. A uh, person holding a cat. Cat looks a little weird. It's not clear where the cat's bottom is. That's right. It's pretty close. Even asked it, uh, show me a picture of me holding a cell phone. Now that is really pretty amazing. The thing had to know the self-portrait was and it didn't match, right? I mean, we're in the same spot. Crazy. Um, and so, of course, in any of these advances that I've shown you, any of these systems, 
I've shown you all of the good examples, and people put good examples in their paper and their talks. But of course, and if you just believe this so far, you would kind of believe that computer vision is a solved problem. It is not. There is no way it's even close. And uh, if you sort of probe these systems, you will see the cracks start to emerge. So for example, I mean, maybe this is kind of a pathological example, but Alyosha put in to Dali, show me an image without a purple elephant. Sorry, that's supposed to say purple elephant. So he said, but he did that and he got pictures of purple elephants because it doesn't understand the image without a purple elephant. It's his purple elephant keyword. It's like, okay, I know that. Um, he had a lot of fun with this. Whatever you do, don't draw. Uh, <laughs> Of course, more purple too much text. So you can see that sort of the reasoning here that's going on is not is pretty shallow. And of course, this you know brings up the fact that also in the news there are plenty examples of the failures of computer vision, and there's plenty of anxiety both within and outside of the community of computer vision about all the ways that this technology is being used in. Uh, not so smart way. You know, things like autonomous cars that detect a pedestrian but chose not to stop, a very strange wording of that, clickbait kind of wording of that. Um, things like face recognition that works well but only on certain people. So there's algorithmic bias in these systems that are being exposed. Um, my favorite, the DC security robot that quit its job by drowning itself in a fountain because somehow we have like AI systems that can outplay every chess player who has ever lived by orders of magnitude, but they can't like avoid an obvious obstacle it's in front of them in a friendly environment to drive right into it, right? So, um, you know, I, I think to, and, and I could show you plenty of other examples. I could show you the examples that from my students' paper that I showed before with those really impressive image captioning results. I didn't show you kind of the second line of results here. Uh, the second line of results, you know, you can feed in an image and the captioning system will very confidently caption things for these images like a teddy bear sitting on a table next to a tree in a car or a spoon and big bowl of fruit sitting on a table with a laptop in the background or my favorite, a man is holding a cat in his mouth. <laughs> Which I think it's really kind of an interesting example because first of all, it's totally wrong. But on the other hand, I think it's sort of a unique concept because I can guarantee you the system never saw any training images and then holding cats in the mouth. So it's like a unique concept, a new concept that kind of makes sense, totally ridiculous, but kind of makes sense. And I feel like that's sort of where we are in computer vision right now. So promising and yet so, so kind of confusing. I'll show you one, one more example. This is something that was created by my student, Ben Chen. So on the left there, you see an image, and that image is of the uh, IMU. Thank you. Uh, so that's the IMU. And if you ask a modern computer vision algorithm what it is, it will say it's a church, which is reasonable, I think, given the appearance. Um, if you ask it what that second image is, it'll say it's a ladybug. The third image is a chihuahua. And the fourth is, of course, a death. Stocking uh, <laughs> and so, you know, what is going on here? Well, ugh, so many mysteries. I think in order to sort of understand what's going on, I think it's useful to sort of think about what we're doing these days in computer vision from sort of first principles. So we're using machine learning, deep machine learning to solve these problems. So what does that mean exactly? And what are the implications of it? Because I think all of these failures can be described, can be explained by those first principles. So in computer vision right now, we are relying on machine learning. We've all heard of machine learning. Many of you are probably experts in it. But if you sort of cut it down to what it really is, it's not the exotic term that those startup companies in Silicon Valley want us to believe it is. It's really a simple idea. It's about finding patterns and training data. It's about fitting a mathematical model, going back to that function F I was showing before, and then applying that model on new data. And I would argue that it's useful, no matter how many machine learning classes you take, you've taken at what level, to sort of think about what really are the first principles of what's going on. And, and I would argue that at a very high level, 
what we do in computer vision when we try to solve a new problem comes down to like five key steps. And at every step, we need to make decisions that can affect how well this system will work. So these are sort of my five key steps, but I'll, I'll just sort of bounce them off you and see, and see what you think. So I would say the first step, which is very underappreciated actually, especially in computer vision, is like precisely defining the problem. Like what exactly are the constraints on a particular environment? What kind of assumptions can we make? And we get ourselves all the time in trouble by like, you know, designing a system in one environment and then some, and then put it as open source code on the web. And then somebody tries to apply it in autonomous vehicles or something where illumination conditions are much more variable. Because we didn't sort of carefully define the assumption. And then I'd say the second key step in machine learning is you need data. And we know that data, training data is extremely important. Um, not this number of images, but typically for deep networks, you want like more than this number of images. You want uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, hundreds of millions, uh, and some billions of the images that are used for training these models. So how you collect that imagery, uh, the biases that it may have, how you label it and so on, a lot of design decisions that are happening in this like end-to-end -end, uh, deep machine learning model. And then you need a model. So you need a mathematical model to fit to the data. And um, sort of the deep neural network is the model du jour. And it will be, I think, for some time and all of its variants that have come later, transformers and so on. Um, but again, I think it's useful to think in terms of first principles. What really is a model? This neural network thing is very, very complicated. But what is it really doing? Well, what it's really doing is something that all of us have done for like our whole lives, trying to fit, uh, fit models to, to data. And so just as like a simple example, not I'm making the simple on purpose. This isn't meant to be patronizing, although I did develop this slide for high school. That's good. Um, <laughs> but let's say you let's rewind to like junior high school when we used to be doing like experiments in physics class. And I don't know about you, but in my physics class, like you draw things and measure how long for them to fall and stuff like that. And so let's say in particular, um, an agent like lands from outer space and it wants to learn how to calculate the circumference of a circle. So what it could do is collect training data, which means it would just draw a bunch of circles. It would draw a circle, measure the radius, measure the circumference, end up with a point on this 2D. And they would do the same thing for another circle and same thing for another circle and so on. And then we have some data. And so what do we do? Well, we somehow create a model that explains that data, which at least in my junior high school class involved getting out a ruler and drawing a line of best fit. But our alien from outer space doesn't know that the line is the best model. Here. Like we're using prior information to say that because we know that's the right answer. In fact, like this model is a much better fit for the data. Uh, this model is even a better fit to the data. And this model is you know, a great fit to the data as well. And so you know, this is like the underlying problem underneath machine learning. If you cut out like all the stuff about neural networks and drop out blah, 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 blah. One of the fundamental problems is that you never have enough data to know exactly which model should be fit. And that means that you may fit the wrong model. You might fit a model that looks good until later it fails because it was the wrong model. Um, okay, so that's like my third ingredient. My fourth ingredient in applying machine learning to a computer vision problem, or really any problem maybe, is an algorithm to do the fitting. And of course, as you know, these are extraordinarily complicated because we're not doing the fitting in one dimension. We're not doing the fitting in three dimensions or four dimensions. We're typically doing this fitting in like a million dimensions. 10 million dimensions and so on. So it's very, very complicated um, to do this. And of course, like the underlying computations that need to be done are fairly simple. It's like you know, just math, but the scale is really incredible. Um, this is sort of a tangent, but uh, I was mentioning the 200th anniversary of IU, uh, which was founded in 1820. It turns out that the first computing device that was actually created uh, 
in physical form was also probably created in 1820, something called the arithometer. It did all the stuff that like we need for doing deep learning back then. It's just that if you uh, compare the thing on the right to the thing on the left, the thing on the right is 100 quadrillion times faster. Other than that, it does all the same basic operations you would have needed to do deep machine learning in 1820. And then finally, the sort of final step, I think, in applying computer vision to, uh, sorry, applying machine learning to computer vision is how to evaluate the results that you get. And the trick here is that like a lot of us are motivated by very long-term goals. For example, I have several projects on autonomous driving. So really the measure of success would be that we strap our algorithm into a car, have it drive around Bloomington and count how many pedestrians we run over and try to minimize that number. Like that would be the way to actually evaluate the system. But of course we can't do that. And so instead what we do is we test on a particular test data set that has all kinds of biases and stuff with a particular quantitative metric, which we designed, it's easy to compute, but like whether the mean corrected average precision of our algorithm being 83.7% means that self-driving car is gonna be safe or not, I don't know. I just know that it's like better than this other person's who is only 79.2. And so, you know, I think this is another problem we're struggling with in computer vision, especially as our techniques are being used in the real world in a way that I think many of us didn't expect they would be used so quickly, is how you actually evaluate how well this thing is gonna work. So like those are sort of my five key ingredients in how most modern computer vision, especially applications work. And I think if you remember like these five first principles, very high level first principles, you can actually explain a lot of the failures that we see. I mean, for example, why is face recognition accurate if you're a white guy? Well, there's, various reasons, but one of the reasons is that one of the data sets that was the standard data set collected at AT&T, uh, Bell Labs, used for decades in face recognition research was collected by people taking pictures of each other at AT&T Bell Labs, and so the photos are horribly biased towards basically middle-aged white, white men. Um, and it's sort of hard to get around this bias. I mean, you can instead download photos from the internet, thinking that that's a more representative sample, but the internet has all kinds of biases as well towards North America, towards uh, wealthier people and so on. So it's, you know, these, these, these problems are subtle, but the, the explanation can be quite simple. Um, or that example of the uh, images that are detected as different things. So these are examples of adversarial examples. So this, these are images that my student purposefully created. So by tweaking a couple of pixels in order to confuse the machine learning algorithm. Um, now, on one hand, that's a little bit relieving because like he had to explicitly try to confuse it. These weren't photos that were just sort of taken naturally. On the other hand, it's extremely distressing that you can change a couple of pixel values that we can't see and suddenly the church becomes a chihuahua. And in fact, these aren't just random. He can make any image into anything you want. Name an object, he can tweak a couple of pixel values and it's there, no problem. So, so why is this? Um, I would go back to my circle example to explain this. I would say that like, you know, let's say, forget images, they're too complicated to think about. Let's think about this blue circle and this red circle. And let's say, or I feed that blue circle into my machine learning, uh, trained machine learning model that I showed you before that was just a, a, a 2D plot. It says the circumference is 100, that sounds about right. But then I make a small change to that circle, and now it says the circumference is negative five. And you're like, wait, the circumference is gonna be negative. Like, how did that happen? Well, it's totally explained if your machine learning model fit a model like this that perfectly explained the training data but uh, has all of these you know, weird discontinuities and stuff. And, and that's basically exactly what's going on with the uh, image case as well. It's just in millions of dimensions, so it's really hard to visualize, but there are like these pockets where you can make a very small change to one, one of those dimensions and suddenly what the algorithm sees is totally different. Um, so as you can see, there's a lot of excitement associated with computer vision right now. There's a lot of like, I would say concern, a lot of mysteries as well, both in the community and outside. 
Um, by the way, I've sort of talked about the state of the technology in computer vision. I think it's also interesting to talk about sort of the state, the effects that all of these changes have had on researchers working in the field. And so if you're curious about this, I'd highly recommend this is latent self-promotion. I highly recommend this paper we published at CBPR last year. It's a completely qualitative paper. It's called The Effective Growth of Computer Vision. It was like a passion project during the pandemic where uh, Norman Sue, who's an ethnographer who was here and now is at uh, Santa Cruz, and I tried to study this explicitly by um, interviewing, interviewing a wide variety of faculty and students and practitioners in computer vision to understand like how they're feeling. And basically the, the message is, you know, this is a field that many people have been in for you know, a decade or more, and yet the entire field has changed beneath their feet in the last 10 years because of deep learning and because of the enormous increase in interest in the field and all of the good things and bad things that that has created. And so I don't know, I, I, the paper is easy to read and I think it's kind of interesting to, to hear what sort of these very top people in the field are, are thinking about. Things like they got into the field to study sort of the fundamental scientific aspects of vision. Now they feel like we're just engineering black boxes of machine learning. Or they talk about how like, you know, students um, will, uh, talk about how the techniques that are older than say five five years old are ancient and that they don't even need to be studied. And you know, just kind of interesting concerns about the, the community as a whole. And I think like also the, the increasing role of, of industry in computer vision has forced many of us to think like, where can we really have the biggest impact? You know, even with all of your amazing computation resources over in the data center, you know, Facebook and Google still have way more. And they have way more data. And they don't have a single PI with 10 grad students. They have enormous billion dollar budgets that are working on computer vision. And so I think in academia, it might sort of force us to think about what are the problems that we should really be thinking about. Probably we shouldn't be um, competing against Facebook and creating the world's best object recognition model. Maybe we should be looking for things that they're not looking at right now. They're not going to make an immediate profit, but they'll be extremely important either for society or technology in a few years. And so I don't know the future of computer vision. I'll just tell you for a few minutes that I have remaining here, something that I'm really excited about recently. Um, and it started as like a completely zany idea about 10 years ago and it's actually grown into something that I think is really very interesting. The, the Zany idea was about 10 years ago, I was, we were thinking about what's next in, in imaging. And one of the answers could be, and it appeared at the time it might actually be wearable cameras because Google Glass was just coming out and there was all this uproar in the popular press about cameras everywhere. And okay, Google Glass has come and gone and actually most of these products have come and gone. GoPro I think is still, used in some, in some niche, to, uh, in some like extreme sports and stuff. Um, and of course there is, there are many reports of things like augmented virtual reality kinds of glasses that may come out of Facebook and they come out of Apple with, you know, they don't have any inside information, but there's, you know, there's a lot of talk about these things. And so these devices could be, could really change a lot in computer vision and the way we think about photography. Um, when I first heard about them, I thought, and who is so completely egotistical to think that there are cameras to record every moment of your life? And uh, then I tried one and the answer was me, because it actually was really fun. It was actually really fun. Like if you, I was wearing a little camera that took a picture every like 30 seconds throughout my day. And I got all of these cool photos that I would have never like, Taken, you know, the picture of my mom at the breakfast table. I never would have been like, hold that funny goofy pose. I'm going to take a picture of you as you're chewing. And yet, you know, these pictures remind me of what she's like and of something that I'll that I'll cherish on a day to day day to day basis. And of course, you can get video from these. Um, for during the pandemic, I wore video on a lot of the bike rides that I that I took. And you basically get like this view of what the world looked like according to my eyes, like as I moved my uh, and I, as, I, as I looked at things, you can see how I interacted with people, you see all sorts of things like that. So you get this very personal kind of egocentric 
uh, human-centered view of how people are interacting with the world. And isn't that the whole goal of computer vision from the first place? It wasn't really to understand imagery from surveillance cameras. It was to figure out how people's visual systems work and to solve like problems that would be relevant to things like robotics as agents are moving around the world. And maybe, just maybe, the next step in photography, who knows, but maybe, could be wearable cameras. Like maybe it was the daguerreotypes that I showed you before, Kodak camera brought flexible film to the masses, uh, instant photography, digital photography, camera phone, maybe the next thing is wearable cameras. Maybe. Um, maybe not, but maybe. And uh, we in the computer vision community are very sort of excited about this direction. One of the reasons that it's been difficult to work on is that unlike um, imagery from the internet like YouTube and uh, Flickr, you can't easily download like 100 million videos of people wearing cameras. There's lots of legal, ethical, and privacy concerns about that, plus the fact that they just don't exist. Um, so over the last about two years, we and a consortium of universities across the world have been working on collecting this data set, which we just released over the summer. It's probably the largest data set in computer vision. It has about 3,000 hours of video from collected by 900 people. 850 people in 75 locations in nine countries over two years. Um, some of the data, for example, includes things like social interactions. So here, for example, is uh, two people who are playing music together. You can see their, their view, and there's also eye gaze tracking, so you know where they're looking in the field of view. Or, for example, here's um, some data collection. Uh, here's some, some uh, set of people who are playing cards in a social setting. And again, you see what everybody is looking at. You see how people are interacting with one another on a sort of this very fine grain level. Um, so if you're interested, we have a paper, Ego4D. It has like 90 authors because it's a giant effort. And it was published in CBPR last year. So check that out if you're interested. But what I've been most excited about, about these wearable cameras is actually not the consumer applications, but some of the like deeper scientific things that we might be able to answer. Because again, if you're getting the view of what a real person is seeing day to day throughout their lives, it's actually a really interesting tool to study people, and people's behavior. And in particular, we've been doing a collaboration where we're using these wearable cameras and high performance computing together in computer vision to study what is probably the most uh, mysterious and possibly most complicated system on earth. And that's like my four-year-old nephew. Um, because one of the great mysteries in psychology, as well as in computer vision, is how come kids are able to see, learn to see the world in basically a couple of years or less? And how come my you know, a little puppy can see the world, and yet we have been trying for 60 years in computer vision, and still it seems like it's just cool. So what is the secret that they have that the computers don't? Um, and, and we've collaborated sort of on multiple levels with this. So the, the collaborators here are, are Linda Smith, who's in the psychology department here, and Chen Yu, who was here, he's now at the University of Texas at Austin. And they've created these really cool experimental setups where they can bring parents and kids into a lab. They can put gaze trackers and wearable cameras on both of them. So they see kind of moment to moment what the child and the parent are seeing and where they're looking. They have audio and so on. And so they can get a really good idea of um, what are sort of the strategies that lead up to a moment where the child learns a name for a new object. So for example, if I want to teach you the name for a new object like this one, like, how do I go about doing that? What's the most effective strategy? Um, should I say that? Should I wait for you to look at it and then say the name? Should I look at it, look at you, then look at it and say the name? Like, what is sort of the right data that the child needs to be able to do this? And with this kind of paradigm, they're actually able to collect data. And so we've collaborated with them on a couple of levels of abstraction. At sort of the most shallow level, it's been trying to um, help them code their data so they don't have to pay undergraduate students to draw little boxes around and frame this video, we can do that for that. We can do that automatically. We can help them figure out where hands are in their data because hands are really important because it's a thing that we use to manipulate the environment. Um, or we can see how they're grasping objects and so on. 
or we can see and try to model how they are uh, attending to objects. So this is showing where a person is looking in their field of view according to a gaze tracker and us trying to develop models that actually match that. And by creating these models, we can better understand how different people sort of decide what to look like, look at and see. But it's sort of a deeper level. Um, I think what's really exciting about this kind of work is that if we can figure out what kids are doing, then we could also apply some of those same principles to computer vision. And so you can view this in different ways. I mean, kids do not probably use deep neural networks in their head, although there's something vaguely related, but it's probably not exactly, they don't have GPUs in there, I know that, for example. So the answers in terms of how the hardware works, that's going to be answered elsewhere in neuroscience and cognitive science and so on. But I think another interesting thing to think about is just like how do kids learn from the perspective of what data are they collecting? What kind of learning paradigm do they use? Because they don't, if they want to learn what a car looks like, they don't download 10 million images of cars from the internet like we do. Instead, they get like a lot of experience playing with their little toy car at home. And from that, they're able to massively generalize to every car that they'll ever be able to see. And the reason that they're able to do that could be that there's like unique properties of this first person view that they're able to see. There's unique properties, the fact that they're able to interact with the environment, to try things, to see how they, the, the object reacts to them, to see how the object appears from different angles because they're able to actively manipulate that object and so on. Those are probably really good. Um, and so we have some preliminary results. And if you're interested in some of the insight we've, we've gotten, uh, feel free to check out my website. But basically at a very high level, what we found is that if you take data that's collected from kids, and use it as training data for a neural network, it actually works better than if you take data that's collected from parents. And you can use sort of the insight that we got there to actually make computer vision training data sets better. So without modifying the architecture of the neural network, you can actually do that. So, um, so with that, I want to just wrap up here and say, first of all, what's next for these machines that see? I don't know exactly. But what I do think the more that I am in uh, computer vision, I realize how impressed I am by humans. And so I think as we go forward, whereas the computer vision community was often thinking about how to replace humans, like how to do something as well as a person does, I think going forward, we really need to think more about how humans and machines can collaborate, how machines can learn from people, how people can learn from machines, how they can work together in an environment to do things, how, 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 and how these systems can really help people's lives. And hopefully, hopefully not make them worse because there's a lot of scary things going on out there. And I think we in the university, especially, are the ones that need to be um, thinking about all of the legal, social, ethical implications of these systems as they go out there. Fortunately, we, I think at Indiana University, are really well positioned for this. And we have this new bloody center for um, artificial intelligence. We're, we're still sort of starting up, but I think it's sort of the, like such a wonderful visionary place to like study AI and computer vision and machine learning and all these things from all these different perspectives across the university, as opposed to just sort of the narrow tech. And so with that, I'll just thank you very much. If you're interested in learning about any of my work, uh, there's the, vision, the lab website and I'm happy to take any questions. Hey David, thank you. That was awesome. Uh, quick question. So, you know, as you're talking about uh, auto autonomous driving, you know, what jumped in the back of my head, what a lot of us here were part of, is the experience that we had with DARPA in the Grand Challenge in 2005. And, you know, that was based on GPS and LIDAR. And was that the progression? Of, of that funding from DARPA leading into the computer vision uh, arena? As far as I can tell, absolutely. DARPA had, I think they had two years, I forget which year, they had two rounds of that. There was like- Four was their first round. year, five was the second year. Yeah, yeah. The other challenge was in the urban challenge. Yeah. And I remember like for the one in the desert, it was like, you know, I can't remember exactly, but like the winning car like drove like half a mile in the first in flames or something like that. It wasn't quite that bad, but it's something like that. Whereas then just a couple of years later, I mean, 
given all that investment and all the people sort of organized around it, I mean, the, the urban challenge was really quite impressive. I mean, it was able to navigate around the very realistic city environment. And then I think you can literally trace the trajectory of people who then start startup companies based on that, and then you know, got picked up by big companies like, uh, like Uber and Tesla and Google and stuff like that. So I think absolutely DARPA is what, what, is what caused that to happen. Well, one of our cars landed up on a couple of hay bales. I see. Got to be catching on fire. <laughs> I had a quick question. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, just looking at some of the thing for the images were misclassified. It was pretty funny to find the bicycle and the bedspread. It was a little bit scary to mistake the IMU for a ladybug, but I know we've all been there. <laughs> were there any misclassifiers that were kind of interesting that made you go like, oh, I guess asparagus does look a lot more like whatever someone might make a state asparagus for? Yeah, I think those are. Those often do actually occur. I, I don't have a great example here. I mean, even this one I think is kind of interesting because if you look at it, okay, there is a circle there. Yeah, that, that one was, a yeah. There. I thought those there's circles all over. And look, so what makes me not see a circle when clearly there is a circle there? So there are, are like interesting examples uh, like that. Um, I'm trying to think if I can think of any specific other ones we've seen. Um, I mean, I, I think that is like, an interesting direction for computer vision machine learning is that I think um, it could help expose maybe biases that people have, or, or it could like, for example, what are what are optical illusions? Optical illusions are basically adversarial examples created for humans. And some of those adversarial, some of those optical illusions actually also confuse machines, some of them don't. And I think kind of the Mismatch between those or the match between those could reveal things both about how human vision works and how it should. But it's a really good question. Hi, hey, David. Um, can you summarize what uh, what people are doing with higher dimensional types of data, whether it's like a maybe a 360 image or we can do LIDAR or we can do you know, photogrammetry of objects? Uh, is anybody using that data to? So not that this isn't hard enough, but right. are you looking at, you know, what would you do if you had, you know, uh, depth data or more information? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, uh, especially until a few years ago, I think the computer vision community was sort of narrowly focused on images, because I think their view sort of was that people are able to look at a photograph and understand all these things about it. So if the goal is to create machines that can do the same thing as people, like that should be the goal. And we shouldn't use multimodal information, even though it's often available. Um, that has really changed over the last few years. I think self-driving cars has been one big impact there. Um, so there is a lot of work. It's, it's, it's less, but there is a lot of work, a lot of interest in 3D vision. Um, and that has lots of different flavors. You know, some of the flavors are given multiple 2D images, trying to create a 3D reconstruction of a place. There's a lot of work in that. For autonomous driving, um, until fairly recently, my understanding, I don't have any inside information, but my un understanding was the vehicles mostly did not use vision. So they were mostly relying on LIDAR, radar, uh, other kinds of sensing. My understanding is more recently that they are using vision more prominently, um, but you know, it, it makes LIDAR gives you much more information. So why not, why not use it? And in the computer vision community, also people are starting to think in terms of like language. So I showed the caption examples there. That's sort of a very recent thing. Also like speech and um, speech data, audio data. And there's like some very early work on like haptics, so, like manipulation and touch kind of sensing, which is obviously really important for human learning. It's probably going to be important for robots too. But I think we're still pretty early days. Questions? Thank you so much. So while Matt is making his way back to the podium, uh, if everybody can just pause for a moment. Uh, but when he's done, there's still a lot of food left over here. We, of course, have the Research Services Expo still going on. The students are going to return to their posters. So please uh, take those opportunities to 
finish out research cyber infrastructure day. I'm just positioning myself. <laughs> I did want to say thank you, David. That was fascinating. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm honored and glad that we have the opportunity to support research at Point Um And um, part of why we all come to work every day is to do that. So that's very rewarding to hear how, you know, the things that we do that we take for granted day to day actually make a difference. So thank you very much for that. Um, I wanted to share real quick that um, this is a sad day for me to say this out loud. One of our colleagues who's been around here for a long time has decided to uh, hang out with her husband during the day and not get work anymore, which I'm gonna miss. So Teresa Miller, been with us for 45 years. She, her last day, or make Forty-seven. Don't start a new chant. I was, I was going to say fifty-five, but I got crucified yesterday when I said that. So I'm just trying to be nice. So I think you know that without Teresa keeping us in check, RT would not be RT. Uh, a lot of the things that we've done at the university wouldn't be the way they are today. Teresa has been in grants management, among many other things, for a long time and has helped IU work through hundreds of millions of dollars in grants and contracts. Right? That's kind of in her wheelhouse. That's been in her wheelhouse for a long time. And she does an amazing job. Uh, you know, Monday, next Monday is going to suck because. <laughs> for me, not for you. you know, Dan, we'll see if Dan leaves the house. Or barn all the time. Uh, so I wanted to say thank you to Teresa and everything that she's done uh, at IU. We'll do something more formal uh, for her uh, here soon. But Teresa, you know, you rock. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs>